Well, hello, everyone. My name is Scott Teagues. I am a professor in the Department of Biology at Oakland University, and I will be hosting uh, the talk today by Dr. Mary Jamison, uh, a colleague of mine here. I'm, al uh, I'm also on the steering committee for the Campus Alliance for Sustainability in the Environment, KSOU, which is this uh, grassroots kind of ad hoc group that I've been involved with for the past, um, past four or five years, something like that, who has been organizing this uh, speaker series. So today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mary Jamison, a colleague of mine here in the biology department. She started with us in 2015. Uh, prior to that, she was doing a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And prior to that, she was doing a postdoc at my alma mater in Boulder, the University of Colorado uh, at Boulder. Uh, she runs the Jamison Biodiversity Lab. And uh, the aim of that lab is to support plant and insect conservation in a changing wor world. So she does a lot with native plants and native pollinators. Uh, she's been a particularly good collaborator for me, um, doing some management on our Oakland University Biological Preserve. Um, she's helped wrangle resources to promote native plants there. She's helped with the uh, prescribed burn that we hope to do there next month. And she's been a great addition to our, our environmentally oriented community at OU, which is, has been a bit sparse until only recently. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Mary so we can hear about her talk today. So Mary, take it away when you're ready. Okay, thanks so much, Scott. Um, as I was mentioning to a few folks earlier, I'm sorry, but I've been sick lately. So um, please forgive me if I I have to take a drink of water here, mm -hmm. or um, if my talk is a little more disorganized than usual. Um, can you all hear me okay? Loud and clear. Yeah. You can yeah. see me? Okay, great. Okay, so I will share my screen here, and my goal is to get through this talk in about 45 minutes. I try my best at that, but I have a lot of slides that I want to get through, and I know I probably won't get a say all the things I want to, but the goal is to hopefully have time at the end to answer any questions from the audience and hopefully to introduce some of our student leaders and um, to really have more of a discussion so that you all can ask me some questions that you would like to ask. Okay, so um, I'll ask just to hold questions to the end, but hopefully Lily and Jane, you guys can just check into the chat and see um, if there are any questions there. And at the end, we can look through those questions. So, okay, here we go with this world whirlwind of a presentation that I'm going to do. So um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, today, I'll be talking about gardening for biodiversity conservation and connected communities. I ran that title by my husband and he said, he wasn't so sure about connected communities. He didn't know what that meant. So I'm gonna just start there. Um, so connected communities means a couple of things to me. Um, hey Mary, me, Mary, did you have your screen shared? I don't know about the others. I don't oh. see anything, just checking. Thanks Scott for yep. that. I am no, so I can sorry. See okay, so let's, this will be more fun with photos. <laughs> you, can see me, you can see this now? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Great. Okay. So yes, please do just shout out, Scott, if you, <laughs> if anything um, it doesn't look right here. Okay. So gardening for biological diversity and connected communities. What does connected communities mean? Okay. So it means a couple of things to me. Um, first off, it is the connections between the organisms that live in the environment. And I am an ecologist, so I teach about ecological interactions. And often that's focused on the plants and animals, right? This is what a typical food web looks like that we might share in an ecology class. This is, um, you can see the different trophic levels here. We start with the producers or this nice oak tree here. We live in Oakland County, so that's an appropriate um, species to be looking at. And then we have the consumers, the secondary consumers and the tertiary consumers. And all of these organisms are linked in this complex food web. 
But often we don't see humans in this food web. And that's something that I wanted to really talk more about today in the sense of connected communities. So there are a lot of people who are doing great things all over campus, all across our local Detroit metropolitan area and across the world. And today I'd like to focus on some of those stories. Um, there are a number of community partners that I've been fortunate to work with over the years. I'm gonna try to highlight a few of these community partners today, but there's so much that I'd love to talk about and I just don't know if I'll be able to get to everything today. So I'm gonna try to zip through a handful of stories. Some people know me as the strawberry professor. I don't know. I, I studied strawberries for a handful of years. I love strawberries. I started working on strawberries because, well, I initially, in my graduate education, I worked on invasive plant species and how do we control invasive plant species? And I realized that I had to do a lot of killing and I didn't really want to do so much killing. I had to kill a lot of plants. I had to um, plant invasive species to study them. And so when I went into my postdoc, I decided I want to study something that I don't have to kill and that would be beneficial to our community. So I thought, well, I'm going to study strawberries. Everyone loves strawberries. So I decided when I came to Oakland University that I would start studying strawberries. And I've always been interested in trophic interactions. Um, in particular, when I started my PhD, I got really interested in understanding how species are connected through chemistry. So how chemistry links species, um, both pollinators and herbivores, but also I've always been very interested in that, how we as humans are altering the environment. So I specialize in two areas of research chemical ecology and landscape ecology. Um, but really, I just love to study plants and insects. So I'm gonna tell you about the fun plants and insects today and not talk as much about um, the details of the research. Before I begin though, I wanna start with this word privilege. And what does that mean? Well, if you look up the word privilege, this is a definition you'll get. It's a special right, advantage, or immunity granted or available only to a particular person or group. And the example it gives is education is a right, not a privilege. But I would like to just start out my talk today saying that I don't think this is true. And I think we all can acknowledge that it's not true. Education is a privilege. And so I wanna think about that word privilege for a moment. And why this means something to me is if you know a little bit about my background, my origin story is that my mom who is from South Korea, she grew up at a time during the Korean war. She was not able to go to school. She did not have the privilege of going to school. Rather, she took care of her children, uh, her siblings, her brothers and sisters um, in Korea as the war was going on. And she's got a number of stories, um, heartbreaking stories. Um, and so I like to start there because I am an academic. I am, my business is in academia and training students. And I like to start with the origin. My privilege is that I get to work chasing butterflies on a daily basis. I get to work with wonderful beautiful organisms, students, and colleagues. My privilege is that my, in my academic background, I've made wonderful, beautiful friends across the world. And these friends I still stay in touch with and they support me in my academic endeavors. My privilege is that I have an amazing academic family and one that continues to grow. And I wanna mention this man in particular, this is Chip Taylor. Some of you may recognize him. He is the founder of Monarch Watch. And he was my first 
real mentor, I would say. I mean, I, I was not the kid that was chasing butterflies as a kid. I did get into butterflies in high school and I was fortunate to go to college and learn from Chip. I worked in his lab for four years and everything that I do now is really inspired by this man. Um, I've been fortunate to have a number of other mentors over my life, um, but Chip is really the person who has inspired me most. Um, as you can see, um, this is from a recent Monarch Watch. Um, uh, I think it was the 40th anniversary of Monarch Watch. I recently went back to Lawrence, Kansas to visit and everything I've learned um, really in terms of my interest in pollinators has been from this man. So he is an amazing um, champion of monarch butterflies, but also generally just education, conservation and research. Okay, so now back to what I'll be talking a little bit more about. Um, so I wanna talk about my interest in understanding anthropogenic change and how it influences uh, plant and insect populations in particular, but generally biodiversity. And so I'm happy to be talking to the sustainability group on campus today. And I just wanna highlight what this word sustainability means um, through this graphic produced by the United Nations. These are um, our 17 sustainable development goals. And so what is sustainability? Well, sustainability very much integrates biodiversity. And that's both the diversity of humans and the diversity of flora and fauna. And so I'm gonna to touch on a handful of these goals and kind of weave in and out on through a variety of different stories in this presentation today. We live here in Oakland County in a beautiful area. We are very fortunate to have this amazing campus and a campus with a great history. If you don't know that history, I invite you to come visit Meadowbrook Hall and learn a little bit more about that history, the history of Matilda Wilson Dodge um, pictured here. So you, you may know that this is um, what was a historic family farm and um, property. Here we have the root cellar of um, John Dodge and we have the old barn. And some of you may know that we have um, where the location of the student organic farm is where they had the original uh, chicken coop. And that has evolved over many years to different become different things, including a preschool and um, is now the site of the Laboratory for Outdoor Research, Agriculture, Conservation, and Sustainability. And we have this beautiful campus, but I think that there is a lot more that we could do on this campus. And I'm so excited to see that there are a lot of different organizations like KSOU and the Native American Advisory Council and the student groups like the Pollinator Club and the Native American student groups who are trying to help improve sustainability on campus today. So the sustainability that I'll be talking about today is really related to biodiversity conservation, in particular with pollinators and plants. And so I wanna introduce a few of our most valuable players. Um, so I call these the MVPs. Um, or in this case, we have the most valuable photographer. So this is Joseph Ferrero. You'll be seeing some of his beautiful images throughout my presentation today. Here we have him taking some pictures at one of our biodiversity gardens on campus. Um, and here we are at the pollinator garden, um, which has evolved into a beautiful garden um, and this couldn't have been done without the help of Case OU. And so this originally started as a pollinator garden and some people might be confused about why we changed the name to biodiversity garden. And I'll tell you that the reason that we did that is because we wanted to be more inclusive, inclusive of all life that live in this garden. 
um, we started seeing some amazing organisms in the garden, um, praying mantids, luna moths, lady beetles. And as you may or may not know, these are not pollinators, but rather they're part of the biodiversity of these wonderful gardens. So we changed the name to Biodiversity Garden. And um, so I wanna, I'll continue showing Joe's beautiful photos, but just kind of give a shout out to him and say, this is actually one of the pollinators that we found in the garden this summer. And so if you wanna know what makes a pollinator, well, you can just look to Joe's photos to see what makes a pollinator. I love these photos so much because Joe is able to capture the hidden details that most of us don't see. Um, so one thing you have to do to be a pollinator is you have to be carrying pollen from flower to flower, from one species to the same species and moving that pollen in a way that leads to seed production or fruit production. So that's kind of simply put what is required. Some insects and other animals are incidental pollinators, accidental pollinators, but bees are by far the most important pollinators that have evolved in a mutualistic relationship with plants. They have special hairs on their bodies that allow them to pick up significant pollen loads. And so Joe's photos are great in illustrating um, the role of the pollinator. Um, we also though have a number of other important players and I would say students are gonna be at the forefront of this talk. Um, without these students and our colleagues, um, recent graduates um, featured here, um, members of KSOU, we couldn't have these wonderful gardens on our campus and they have been so important to maintaining these gardens. And I think these gardens are wonderful because they've brought together a lot of diverse groups. This is a picture from um, an event that was hosted by KSOU and the OU Pollinator Club. And featured here, we have our student body president um, chatting with uh, Joseph Ferraro, our photographer. Um, so as some of you know, Miriam, um, she has been a huge supporter of sustainability initiatives on campus, including our campus gardens. And so of course we wanna give her a shout out and to all of the members of Student Congress for making all of these wonderful things happen on campus. Hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at our gardens, but if not, I'll walk you through the gardens as we go through our presentation today. So here's another great photo from Joe. Um, so this is one of our green sweat bees. And I love this because it's kind of a front on headshot. You can see um, the bee in action. So what are the bees doing? They're both collecting nectar and pollen. Okay, so here you can see um, an aster or um, this might be a common sunflower or this in this case, a woodland sunflower. And that's actually a composite flower. And inside the head of that flower, you have many, many flowers. And you can just see here, this is one of the flowers and you can see the bee's tongue coming out here, trying to get some nectar from that flower. Okay. so. We call it the biodiversity garden now um, to be more inclusive. And so here's a picture of our new biodiversity garden sign. We're really happy to have that. Um, that is something that Student Congress was really championing and um, have been so instrumental in having installed in the garden. Um, myself and students in my lab helped make this garden. Um, Sarah Griffith, she put on her, um, from KSOU put on her graphic design touches and 
I don't know why it took so long to get this sign installed, but um, you know, sometimes that's how it happens at the university. It took us nearly five months to get this um, sign installed, but it's there and we're very happy about it now. So if you haven't taken a look at these gardens, this project, which was started by KSOU has just evolved into this thing um, that has really been, I think, spearheaded and championed by Student Congress. And I'd like to say that they have been the ones to support financially this garden. And that is so important. Um, so I hope that people love this garden. Um, but one thing that we have been very conscientious of is to make sure that this garden doesn't look too weedy or, you know, it's important to remember that everyone has a different perspective of what beauty is. And so when we decided to make this garden, um, I went to my garden guru, uh, Jane Giblin, and I asked her, what do you think? Should we have a garden that is really um, full of plants or spaced out so that you could see the individual plants? Maybe they could have labels. because there are different kinds of gardens and different people like different kinds of gardens. Well, I took Jane's advice and we decided to just plant it full of plants. And so this is a really dense planting. It looks a little bit more wild, but we also try to maintain it to be a, a bit more tame. And you'll notice that there are mostly almost 95% native plants in here, but there are also some non-native plants some perennial plants like these yellow or orange mums at the front. And we add those to just bring in a bit of color in the fall when there aren't as many um, different flowering plants. In Michigan also, we have a lot of pressures from herbivores like deer. And so it's difficult to have all of our native plants. And sometimes there are introduced plants that can be valuable in gardens. And that's something I wanna to touch on a little bit today. So this word biodiversity, this is a word just like sustainability that belongs to the people, to the plants, to all of life. Um, and I speak about it um, because biodiversity needs everyone. And so in my lab, we do strive to work with community partners and collaborators on projects that link research, conservation, and education. And so there are a number of community partners that I would like to highlight today. Um, in addition to KSOU, we have the Native American Advisory Council and the Native American Student Group, which is doing wonderful things on our campus. We have the recently established Native American Heritage Site. Um, here, this group is um, putting out stakes for the pawpaw orchard, um, which has also involved, evolved into this wonderful um, native plant food garden. Um, it's an orchard with a lot of different native species that have, that were historically and also in the present, um, very important to um, native communities, um, native peoples, in the Michigan area. They've also installed um, other gardens throughout the site, um, which have species of um, cultural importance to the Anishinaabe. Okay, so now I wanna step back and talk about why do we do this work from my perspective as an ecologist and as an entomologist. Well, we do this work because you may have seen it in the news, but insects are declining. And this is a concern. This is a phenomenon that has been coined the insect apocalypse. In this headline, you'll miss them when they're gone. Well, that's absolutely true. And I wanna try to first tell you a little bit about the problem and then why it's such a big problem. And today we're gonna to really focus on pollinators, although I'm really um, 
supportive of our mission is to support all of biodiversity. But you can see um, there are, this is a, some data from the International Union of Conservation of Nature, um, the IUCN. Um, they have the red list, which you may be familiar with, um, which is the international organization that lists species as endangered. So you may have heard that the monarch butterfly was listed on the red list as endangered. Um, just to kind of clarify what that means, um, first off, this is the migratory population. Um, there's a population that migrates um, from Canada, North America to Central America and to Mexico. Um, we also do have resident populations um, in California. And, and this is just for the migratory um, monarchs. It has not yet been listed federally on the Endangered Species Act, the federal US Endangered Species Act. So that means that it's not federally protected. Um, so there's no legal protection at this point in time, but it is under review. And um, the hope is that this species will um, be added to the list. Um, but in addition to butterflies, we have um, this group here that are in decline. So red means decreasing. Um, these are hymenopterans. Um, ants are hymenopterans, and so are bees, bees and wasps. Um, so this group is also in decline. And then, of course, um, another, I just want to quickly point out grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are really in decline. And this is because we've lost a lot of our grassland ecosystems um, due to fire suppression and other cultural practices that have really um, also agriculture. Um, so this was a um, statistic from a paper I pulled out um, that I thought was quite um, startling. In this paper um, that was done in Europe, it was a research study performed in Europe, and they found that um, looking at a long-term database of um, nearly 30 years, they found a 75% decline in insect biomass from protected areas areas that were actually protected by um, the, in this case, uh, the German government. And so the loss in degradation of habitat is really the key threat to insect decline and to the decline of pollinators. And that's because of a number of factors, um, not just urbanization. So we see we're changing this landscape. Um, our cities are going up in pink. We have our urban areas, but really more so due to agricultural intensification and agricultural land use. So you see here why we've lost most of our grasslands is because we have our grassland areas that were traditionally grasslands are now in cultivated crops. And this is a very tricky thing because we need to feed people. This is one of the primary goals of sustainability. And so we need these croplands, that's absolutely true. But I hope that I can maybe convince you that we could be doing agriculture in a little bit different way. Um, so in addition to this land use change, though, there are a lot of factors contributing to insect decline and pollinator decline. And so some of these factors are introduced species. And for pollinators, in particular bees, this is uh, really important. There are a number of introduced pathogens that are threatening our bee populations. Um, but we also have factors like pollution climate change, and a number of other anthropogenic changes that are threatening our pollinators. So why is this important? Well, it's important because insects provide important ecosystem services. They're important food source for organisms like birds. They're important in pest control and controlling some of our agricultural and agronomic pests. Here we have these parasitoid wasps. Um, feeding on a um, tomato hornworm. And they're also important in nutrient cycling and pollination services. 
And so today I'm gonna to focus mainly on pollinators. Why do we care about pollinators? Well, we care about pollinators for one um, reason is because they're important in crop production. They are either directly or indirectly thought to contribute to production for about a third of our crops. And that amounts to about $215 billion annually in the US alone. And why else do we care about pollinators? Well, for our, in our natural ecosystems as well, this biodiversity relies on pollinators. So all of the beautiful flowers that you see out in nature, they depend on pollinators. Um, so throughout our area, we have um, amazing stewards of plants and pollinators like at, um, this is a picture from Innovation Hills um, in Rochester Hills. Um, this is a park where they've done some great restoration work, adding more native plant species. Um, here we have Stony Creek Metro Park, and then a handful of the flowers that we can find out at the student farm. Um, we also have some more rare species that if you're lucky, if you've been out into some of our natural areas that you might see like the fringe gentian or this Allegheny monkey flower. Um, when I, um, I like to talk about the different threats if if I were in class, I'd be asking, what do you think one of the key threats that I haven't mentioned um, are to these plants? And um, I'll try to bring the students to, well, deer. Deer are actually one of our main threats. Deer eat a lot of our native plant species. It's very difficult to have these beautiful plant species because deer like to eat them. Unfortunately, we have a few remaining. Um, Michigan lily is another one of my favorites. Here we have this green sweat bee um, pollinating the Michigan lily. These were some pictures taken by students out in the field um, doing their great work. Um, and so I talk about native plants a lot and I'll continue to throughout this talk, but I just wanna say that there are a number of other valuable non-native plants. And so just because a plant is not native doesn't mean that it's inherently bad. I love my zinnias. I plant my zinnias at my house and Cosmos as well. In Michigan, these are not invasive species. Uh, we don't have a concern about them escaping into the wild. In other areas, that may not be true. And so it's important to do your research and find out what is locally um, what's locally viable to plant, what is not likely to become invasive um, if you're going to think about planting a non-native species. But I can plant these from seeds and these seeds are organic seeds and that makes me happy. So there, I can get all these flowers for about $2. So food gardens, back to food gardens. Well, we have an amazing organic student farm that some of you might be familiar with and the students do a lot of great things. Um, there are a lot of awesome community members contributing to that student farm as well. But you can also have these gardens in your backyard. And I'd like to encourage more people to try this out. I think my neighbors, I put this garden in my backyard a year ago and my neighbor to the, to the right of me said, oh, good luck with that. You're gonna have, you're gonna be feeding the deer. And well, I did feed the deer, that's absolutely true. But I also was able to feed my family. And so that's just something I want you to keep in mind um, that you can, even in a, I live in a very suburban area in Rochester Hills, you can have a garden in your backyard. And if you just want an example of how to do it, just come on over to my house and I'll show you. Okay, so the key aim of my lab, you know, the key aim of many others, um, community partners um, around this area um, are really supporting plants, pollinators. Um, so here's a diversity of the different organisms we've seen um, across 
our many sites that we study. Um, I want to give just a quick background um, about the diversity of butterflies and bees. We're going to focus on diversity of butterflies and bees. Well, butterflies, I think of as the, the gateway insect. Everyone loves butterflies. And that's just, there's no um, denying that. Um, so for butterflies, there are about 750 species in the US and about um, 1,800 in the world, 160 in Michigan. Uh, for bees, we have um, even greater diversity. So we have about 20,000 in the world. So kind of similar to butterflies. We're in the US, we have 3,600 species. And in Michigan alone, we have almost 500 species and we're finding new species every year. So the approach that we take to pollinator conservation is um, through the help of a number of students, we conduct plant and pollinator surveys. We also, through the help of many individuals across campus, like the Teagues Lab, KSOU, Native American Heritage Site, we try to help contribute to habitat management. We're also helping with our local community partners like Oakland Township Parks and Oakland County Parks. Um, and we help them monitor projects like invasive species removal, controlled burns, mowing, and also native wildflower plantings. Um, what are we working on over at, I wish I could tell you about all of the projects, but it's really hard to fit it all in. What are we working at over at the Student Organic Farm, or as some of you might have heard this term, the Lorax. So the Lorax is what we've coined um, this corner of Butler and Adams. It is called um, the Laboratory for Outdoor Research Conservation, or Outdoor Research, Agriculture, Conservation, and Sustainability. And so that's kind of a mouthful. That's a acronym that Tom Raffle came up with, and we really like that. And so it's kind of a play on words, the Lorax. Um, and there are a lot of exciting projects that are happening over here. I know that the KSOU group, you guys were able to go over and check out what's going on at the student farm with Faye Hansen, who's the director of the farm. Um, but we're really exciting, excited about a lot of new developments. Um, we've got Bill Hamilton in the audience here and just a big shout out to him because he has given us a donation that will allow us to have a new greenhouse at Oakland University. And we're so happy for that because we've been waiting for this greenhouse for eight years now. And so thank you, Bill, so much for, yes, that. Um, so stay tuned and um, yes, more to come on that story. So another big thing um, that we like to do, um, my students, myself, we really love to communicate science. And so I just wanna focus a little bit on that. Um, we're doing a lot of communicating science through social media. Um, I, Social media is kind of a ebb and flow for me. Sometimes I'm more active, sometimes I'm less active, sometimes I need to step away from it. Um, but we try to highlight and feature a lot of stories on our Plants for Pollinators um, Instagram account. So you can check that out if you're interested, following along more with the what's going on on campus and in the local community. Um, and so, what do I want to do today? I just really want to talk about all the cool people doing cool stuff in conservation, um, the community collaborators that we get to work with, and community science. And so community science, this is also, some of you might have heard this word citizen science, and that is a more common word. But when I was starting this work in citizen science, um, one of our collaborators at Michigan State University asked I asked, um, do you guys want us to, um, do you have any suggestions or comments about the manuscript we're working on? And he said, yes, I do. Would you think about using community science? And when he asked that, I thought, oh, of course. Yes, absolutely. We will do that. And that rung a bell to me because um, I mentioned my mom from North Korea, or from South Korea, sorry. Um, she 
it took her more than 10 years to become a citizen. And so for me, it just was more inclusive to start using the word community science. So that's what we're doing. Okay. So some of the cool people I've already mentioned, Joseph Ferrero, he has also an amazing Instagram and website. You can check out more of his work. Um, he has really helped us communicate the science to both scientists and to the general public. His photos are amazing and I cannot do this. Um, I consider myself an okay photographer, um, a hobbyist, but I just can't do what he can do. Um, he has helped us make um, you know, amazing images. We've also worked with um, other local artists like the, some of you know the Decca brothers who work with OU Film Studies. Um, they helped us make this short film you can check out on our website and really showcase um, the different community organizations. So we're trying to do more community science, showcase all these amazing organizations doing great things for pollinators like the Belle Isle Nature Center, like Rochester Pollinators, Oakland County Parks, the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign and Pollinator Partnership. So a lot of really amazing organizations. So again, just the cool people doing cool stuff. Um, we've been working on this book project for a little bit longer than I would like to admit to, um, but we have a final draft of it and I got some feedback, some constructive and critical feedback. Um, so we're trying to work on make, doing some revisions. Um, we're working with a, an artist on this as well as with Joe Ferrero. His photos are featured prominently in this um, children's book. Um, but I'm very excited about that. If any of you guys have expertise in publishing or want to um, help us finish this project, um, graphic design, um, we would love to talk with you. Um, so more cool people doing cool stuff. Um, I personally just love all of the work that Oakland Township is doing. If you haven't had a chance to check out some of their properties, I highly recommend going out to Gallagher Creek Park. It's one of my favorites. Beautiful playground and um, beautiful wildflowers. But there are sometimes trade-offs to these flowers, which I'm happy to talk about a lot more. But a friend of mine, um, a mother, she calls this tick park. So that's something just to keep in mind. Maybe we can talk more about that in the discussion. And so when you bring in wildflowers, something you do have to remember and something, and if we're thinking about sustainability, we have to consider, you know, how do we maintain these spaces so that um, they are not just beautiful to look at, but also um, safe to go to. And they do this through mowing around and having open areas. And I just tell the kids, don't run through the wildflowers if you don't want to get the ticks. So, so we're out there um, with students, with community members, both, both doing our traditional pollinator surveys, doing our photo-based pollinator surveys, and um, we're working across farms, gardens, um, throughout the tri-county region, actually going up north a little bit now in a lot of different habitats. Um, we've got a lot of great students working on projects, looking at the effects of um, urbanization, agricultural intensification, and um, I just don't have a ton of time to talk about these projects, but I just wanted to highlight them a bit. Um, current PhD student working on a project with um, sponsored by and with um, partners at U.S. Fish and Wildlife looking at the effects of prescribed fire uh, throughout habitats in the Tri-County region. Um, so we go out, we look at the wildflowers in these areas, and then we go out and document the bees and uh, the diversity of bees. We found over 200 species of bees. These are extremely diverse, beautiful organisms. And we're also interested in studying um, how important these are. So a lot of you know about honeybees, but maybe less um, about the native bees. And we really wanna highlight these native bees because from our research, we have found that these wild native and actually in some cases, non-native bees are important pollinators in our natural and agricultural ecosystems. Uh, we found 64 different species of wild bees 
pollinating strawberries. And you can see honeybees right here um, are not number one, even though there were honeybees um, in this local area and on these farms. Um, how bees respond to urbanization? Well, it depends on their functional traits. What do I mean by functional traits? Well, it depends on a lot of things. Their geographic origin, their nesting strategy, body size, diet breadth, sociality. Um, so I'm kind of nearing the end, so I just want to kind of zip through a lot of these um, highlights from research we've done. If you're interested in learning more about the research, I'd say just check out my website and you can look, look at some of these papers. Um, this was a paper that we did in collaboration with some students at University of Michigan, uh, looking at how urbanization favors exotic bee species. Um, and but for this group and thinking about gardening, I just wanna say the good news is, is that we have found that as you increase the number of plant species in a habitat, you do see an increase in the number of bee species and other pollinators. And so that's good news because we think that if we could put more plants out there, a greater diversity of plants will have a greater diversity of pollinators and other animals. So it's a complex story. It's a complex food web that we got out there. We've got a lot of native plants. We've got a lot of introduced non-native plants that are playing an important role in supporting these connected communities. Um, so zooming out a little bit, we talk a lot about butterflies. Butterflies, everyone loves butterflies, but I just wanna point out here, butterflies are not the most important pollinators numerically or functionally. We've got honeybees, bumblebees, green bees, small bees, medium bees, wasps, and flies pollinating all of these flowers out there. We've got a complicated story. We've got native plants that are important, like bee balm. We've got introduced species like queen ants lace that are all functionally important for our pollinators. And um, so, do you want to? Get out there with us. Um, we do a lot of bio blitz activities um, where we're out there photographing and monitoring pollinators. Reach out to me, let me know. Um, anybody can do this, any device, anywhere, anytime. And we have a number of iNaturalist projects that we've started, we post to. We're working with collaborators across Michigan to document um, Michigan butterflies and bees. Um, we've got guides out there. If you want to learn more about bees and butterflies, you can just find them on iNaturalist. And I would love to share more about the data that we've collected, um, but I'm just going to zip through these because I don't want to go over, definitely don't want to go over an hour. So um, here I would say that we're doing a great job of documenting butterflies as a community. So this is not just data from my lab, but this is as a community, we're documenting. Um, so this is all of the community scientists out there or the citizen scientists. We're documenting about 90% of the butterflies because everyone loves butterflies and they're easier to photograph. They are important pollinators, but bees, I hope I've convinced you bees are extremely important and we're only documenting about you know, less than 25%. But we really need, we need some more awesome photographers like Joseph Ferrero to take pictures like this because it's hard. It's hard to identify bees through photos, um, but we can do it. And you can see um, we've done it, um, bees. Uh, we've documented quite a few species, documented quite a few species of butterflies. Um, we're doing pretty good with our butterflies. Not as good with our bees. And there's a whole diversity out there. Um, easy, easier to take pictures of butterflies. I can do this, but I can do this and the students also just to showcase some of our beautiful flowers here. We've got our pollen on our proboscis of our butterflies. Um, but we need more people. We just need more people because bee species are poorly documented across the US, across North Central US. 
Um, in Michigan, we fall somewhere down along this. So this is the number of observations against the number of species detected. We are down here. We're not doing as good as St. Louis, Ohio. They're documenting a lot more species. Um, they've got a lot more organization, um, organized efforts. So we're trying, but we're taking, we have to do this over time. Um, so anybody could take a photo like this, really, um, with a, a decent digital SLR camera. Um, we've got documenting our, our bees. I think most people could do this um, if they learn. But not everyone can do this. And that's Joseph Ferrero. So again, he's our one of our MVPs. We really can't thank him enough for all of the amazing photos that he's taken for us over the years. Um, he's really helping us um, take a closer look at these organisms. And for that, I thank him greatly. He's really been help helping train our students. Um, and we have a number of other people that we wanna thank. If you guys wanna plant gardens in your backyard, I would point you to Rochester Pollinators. They have an amazing guide on their website. Um, we've helped contribute to um, making recommendations for what species to plant along with folks like Jane Giblin. Um, and they're doing awesome work out there and you can get more involved with their organization. Uh, you can email pollinators at trentcreative.com. Um, they're doing some great things, especially in the Rochester area. And lots of other things going on all across uh, our area as well. So um, lots of opportunities to get involved. And with that, um, I would just like to say um, there's everybody can be helping with pollinator conservation. If you want to see more flowers out there, if you want tips to know how to do this, um, just talk to me. Um, there's a, we have recommendations for species you can plant. Um, and also, you know, it's important to keep in mind that not all weeds are bad. Not all native species are bad. Some are actually quite important um, for our butterflies and bees. So if you wanna learn more, please feel free just to reach out to me and we would love to work with all of you guys. So please send us an email, please send me an email and I will do my best to get back with you. And with that, I would like to say, I'm happy to answer any questions and I'll just end with this slide here with all of our community collaborators. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Mary. So went awesome. Uh, so if folks have questions, you can uh, raise your hand or just unmute yourself. I do have a question you've uh, mentioned a couple times. Yes. Um, I, I'm trying to plant as many, I'm planning to plant nothing but natives in my in my yeah. garden. I work at the garden at church. We've planted a bunch of natives. Um, but what happens, and it's grand, it's, it's been terrific. But one thing that comes up is people will say, oh, I planted a butterfly bush. And I say, well, that's not native. But, and they say, but the pollinators love it. And yeah. My kids love Twinkies too. It does that mean that's yes. what well, that is a good question, and you'll see that a lot of people have different opinions about that. And I will give you my personal opinion about it. And if others want to chime in, we have a lot of experts here, like Jane Giblin, um, Valerie Mullaney. We have a lot of experts I see in the room. So, um my personal opinion is you have to do your research for your area. In Michigan, butterfly bush is not invasive. In southeastern U.S., it is invasive. So I would say in southeastern Michigan, I would not recommend that species be planted. But in Michigan, I know that this is, I don't have it in my garden, but um, I've thought about putting it in my garden. I mean, I've seen it at, um, they have it out at, um, you know, this was a discussion we had with um, Stony Creek Metro Park. Um, they have it in at their, in, their um, entrance. Um, it's in the Monarch Watch Garden in Lawrence, Kansas. And so 
Um, again, I have zinnias in my yard. Just because it's not native doesn't mean it is problematic. Um, it's You have to be concerned whether, so if it's a well-established plant that has been horticulturally tested over a long time, it's meaning it's been in the U.S. for a while, I think it's safe to plant it. Although I will say, you know, with climate change, we never know how things will change. So if, if at any point in time with a warming climate, if something, something could become invasive, there are a lot of unintended consequences of good intentions. There were a lot of um, our invasive plants like Honeysuckle, some of the invasive honeysuckles and autumn olive were planted by the DNR for wildlife. And those have really exploded over time. I think in particular, I've seen just in the time I've lived in the Rochester area, um, autumn olive exploding. It seems to be, you know, I personally think a lot of that has to do with deer pressure. So I think deer have really, um, they, are a heavy selective pressure against some of our native shrubs, but they don't really touch things that are highly toxic, like autumn olive. So I guess that's my kind of long answer, but happy, so, you know, again, this is a widely debated okay. uh, discussion. Well, then I know why I'm, I'm unsure of the answer. Yeah. Yeah. No um, expert. Well, um, yeah, so Valerie, think... you say, wait, I, oh. I'm not really following the chat that much. So I don't know, Lily and Jane, if you want. So Valerie, you say you've had butterfly bush spread in your yard. Well, and, and my Do question wanna... is really about butterfly bush and per se, but native versus non-native. And, and your answer is it's not terrible to put in a non-native, but. I don't um... think it is. Um, but I think we have to be careful and cautious but my father-in-law brought over a bunch of peonies and a bunch of um, uh, some irises and I put them in my yard. These are not ones that are invasive, although we do have invasive irises in Michigan. So that's something that you just, you really have to look up um, the species. You can find, there's a wonderful um, USDA plants database that you can go to. You can check to see if it's introduced Invasive, there are different categories. There is a leaf. Uh oh, she's, I'm the one who's frozen. Legal is impacts. Yeah. Okay. So I um, think Jane Giblin has, has been trying to oh. jump in. Okay, go ahead, Jane. Jane. You want to say something? What I, what I was going to say about butterfly bush is that I, I put it in many, many, many years ago, and I've been steadily taking it out because um, I would say maybe the last 10 years, um, it has become more invasive and it each plant produces millions of seeds. So if if you decide to, to plant it or keep it, um, be sure and take off the seed heads. Yeah, so that's a good point, Jane, and thanks. I mean, see, you have the knowledge that I don't have. I've only lived in Michigan for eight years. You've been doing this a lot longer than I have, and so it's good to hear people like you chiming in with your experience. So, like I said, when you have a changing climate and a warmer world, and you know, then yeah, we you we do have need to be, to be aware concerned yeah. about things like that. So I would say then no to butterfly bush. Based on what Jane has said. Michelle has her hand up. Yeah, I was just going to introduce um, to the discussion the idea of host plants. And that is that our native plants have co-evolved with our pollinators and vice versa. Um, and if, if, we, if we don't have enough native plants in the landscape, then what you'll find is the pollinations also, the pollinations, the, the populations also decrease because there's not fit places uh, for them to, you know, uh, feed on as a larval stage um, and things like that. So that's, 
my understanding of one reason why planning native is that is absolutely work. true and we do um but that is another that's a complicated and i you know i'm not trying to confuse anyone but you know towards the end there and i didn't really have a lot of time to talk about this but um so plantago lanceolata is a non-native cosmopolitan weed and a very important host plant for the baltimore checker spot the Baltimore checker spot is a species that is in decline in throughout the Northeast. It's thriving here. And from our research, I know that it is thriving in some habitats because of this non-native plant, because it is, it does have a native host plant, um, which is a uh, turtle head, but it is thriving because of a non-native plant. So Again, I will always say if you can plant native species because they are adapted to our environments, um, but even native species in some cases can become invasive. And so that's another thing that you mm -hmm. have to consider. So we avoid planting, you know, we love to have our little blue stem, but we avoid planting our uh, big blue stem and other species like that. Like I put, um, I didn't realize, but I think that we put um, Canada goldenrod in our garden on campus. That is also one that can become highly invasive. So that's, again, it's, it's complicated. And I know a lot of people are simplifying the message because it's easier to understand, but I just wanna be cautious of that message because I think whether it's native or not native, it can become invasive. And so we just have to, there's so much great information online now. So you can find out more about the species you plant. But Jane brings up a good point. Like with warming climates, we just don't know um, what's gonna happen with something that, yeah. So if you see it become invasive though, that's when you have to start yeah. You have to start taking it out. But I would say that's true of both native and non-native plants. Yeah, there, there are I, many, many interesting comments in the chat. I would uh, suggest anyone interested in this line of discussion, go there. I think the most important one is from Tina. Don't just trust any local greenhouse to tell you what is native and non-native non or not invasive. They don't know. <laughs> I've had that happen to me. Oh, yes, it's native. It's not. Um, yes. They want um, to sell I, you a plant. So go to these sources. Yeah. So again, so Jane has been someone I go to a lot. She's just a, got a wealth of knowledge. But Bill Snyder at Wild Type, he's kind of the original. He's amazing. Yeah, he like yeah. go to Wild Type Nursery. There are a lot of awesome nurseries that are popping up. Um, and you can find a great list of them. I know, um, I think Rochester Pollinators has assembled a, a great list. Um, and but Bill at Wild Type, he's been doing it for a long time. He's really one of the originals and he is a, an amazing person who knows a lot. So I see a few more hands. Uh, oh, Jerry's got his hand up. I am getting a message that my battery's low, even though my computer's plugged in. So Scott, I'm gonna let you take it over and um, maybe let Jerry go ahead while I fix my problem here. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I wondered if you could comment on a thought I had and that is if you uh, community science versus citizen science, um, a lot of people don't feel like they're part of a community. And so by that word, um, plus it's a much more common word than uh, citizen and also citizen is singular and everyone is a citizen and it's sort of pointing toward that individual. I wonder if that has any merit uh, against the, the, the weight of them too, the two terms. There are a lot of debates out there about which term is better or not. And I know there was even a recent paper published in um, in one of the ecology journals that I read, Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment. And it was arguing for more going towards citizen because that was more recognized, but it was saying it was more recognized by funding agencies. Um, but I just say that, again, we're moving towards community because I think it is inclusive. And it's unfortunate if someone doesn't feel like they're part of a community and we're hoping and trying 
to change that. And I feel like I'm a part of many great communities. And so um, I think if you don't feel like you're part of community, then it would be good to try to find one of these communities, um, these bio blitz activities that are, we've done, um, we've hosted some, there's actually a group in Detroit that is a collective where they've got a number of organizations together um, and they are, so I think it's led primarily by my birds or Michigan, my birds um, and a number of groups and they're doing a lot of bio blitzes around the area. Um, and, um, so, you know, get involved in one of those um, if you feel like you're not part of a community. There's there's also wild ones, North Oakland wild ones. Yes, chance. North Oakland wild ones. I knew I would leave out somebody. <laughs> They're so important, too. That's a great community as well. Um, I, I always try to go to those talks when I can. They have great talks and great information. Wow. And um, I think I think you need to give this talk to our um, to one of our Wednesday night. Uh, I'd meetings. be happy to do so. I'm always happy to visit you guys. I know the last time I went, I went because you guys were giving out seeds, and I was like, oh, I gotta go get to see what new seeds you guys have. So um, yeah, wild, North Oakland Wild Ones, check it out. They're doing some awesome stuff and. Yes, seed sharing. I love seed sharing. We didn't really talk about that much, but in the basement of Dodge Hall, we have lots and lots of seeds for people. Oh, to wow, take. really? Um, I have seeds. lots and lots of seeds in my garage. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we like to share seeds and, you know, thanks with Bill's donation, hopefully we'll get to grow these seeds into plants and then yeah. share the yeah. plants because- um, I know um, Oakland County, they're doing amazing stuff. They gave out $30,000 worth of plants that they bought from wild type. And we yeah. really hope that we can start growing more plants 